Welcome back for our afternoon session. And up next, we have Charles Wolf. Charles Wolf is a professor in the Department of Philosophy, Université de Toulouse, Jean Jaurès, and an associate member of the Sartan Center for History of Science, Ghent University. He works primarily in history and philosophy of the early modern life sciences, with a particular interest in materialism and vitalism. He is the author of Materialism, a Historico-Philosophical Introduction, La Philosophie de la Biologie, in Histoire de Vitalisme, and Lire le Materialisme, and has edited or co-edited volumes on monsters, brains, empiricism, biology, and vitalism, including currently with Donna Jalubenu, the Encyclopedia of Early Modern Philosophy and the Sciences, and with Jay Simons, The History and Philosophy of Materialism. He is co-editor of the book series, History, Philosophy, and Theory of the Life Sciences, published by Springer. Well, hi everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to Chris for his invitation. And it's a pleasure, even in this forum, to be participating in work in homage to David Depew, whose work I've been reading approximately since I came to Boston to do a PhD in the late 90s. And I was hugely obsessed with that book, Darwinism Evolving, for one thing. I could mention other papers, but very attached to my copy of that book. And today I'm going to talk about vitalism and the emergence of biology, focused on the 18th century as a story. And why do I have this wax self-portrait of this interesting figure, Anna Maria Mandolini? Just because she was the great wax anatomist of the time. She had a chair at the University of Bologna in wax anatomy. Rebecca Mesbarger wrote a book about this. And it just occurred to me, this captures roughly captures the problem of what does it mean to model life? Or what does it mean to capture something about life in a scientific form? Which of course is the, I don't know, the central paradox of vitalism, the governing paradox challenge of vitalism and perhaps of biology. So core issues, basic issues in thinking about vitalism. As a rough roadmap, as some people would say, When we encounter the term in the history of medicine, it means, so, you know, I just lettered them, but it means something like the opposite of mechanistic approaches to life. Of course, then the question is, well, opposite how and in the name of what? I'll get back to that. In contrast, if we were having a meeting of early modern philosophy scholars, it would be a very different conversation because they repeatedly use the word vitalism in a way that took me a few years to even accept, because it seems strange, where it strongly seems to mean a vision of matter as conscious or minded or sentient. So it's more of a focus on mind. In that sense, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Then there's a lot of scholarship which uses it in a way I find sloppy. Notice I didn't name any names, but you can do. People will call Aristotle a vitalist, and I accept Sophia Connell's beautiful work. It's certainly not the target of this comment. People call Harvey a vitalist because of a few throwaway sentences in Harvey. People call Locke or Hume or Smith vitalists because of these very, very loose definitions of the word. And in contemporary theory, sort of in the humanities, there's a lot of vitalist language which seems to be a kind of refusal of boundaries between life and non-life, nature and culture, mind, matter, all of which is potentially quite interesting. But it seems to me that these kinds of either loose usage or speculative usages lose or you know, lose sight of a core issue, which to me, and I, this is both a historical suggestion and a conceptual suggestion, I think vitalism makes more sense as a term if we use it strictly to describe theories, and that's not just one theory, but a family or set of theories, in which the key distinction is living versus non-living. Theories that are motivated by answering the question, what's the difference between living matter and non-living matter? 
In today's talk, I focus specifically on so-called Montpellier vitalism, which is to say the doctrine associated with Montpellier Faculty of Medicine. The heyday of this doctrine, and to some extent the heyday of that faculty, was the 18th, 19th centuries. And for a time, I mean, it was a very old faculty, one of the oldest in Europe. For a time, it was the chief rival of the Paris medical faculty. And they play out, and sociologists of science have studied this, and it's interesting. Montpellier versus Paris plays out a kind of holistic, organicist, uh, you know, anti-reductionist program on the Montpellier side versus a more clinically focused, experimental, interventionist program on the Paris side. And it's true that some of this is rhetorical or, you know, the, the public relations operations of both medical schools that seek to brand themselves even in that time and associate themselves with a doctrine. But it really does mean something. And I'm not going to say more today about Montpellier versus Paris, but there is a strong sense that this school has a doctrine. And of course, that doctrine evolves over the 100, 150 years of its life. And um, that's its own story. Again, in the question of what we're talking about when we talk about vitalism, I want to mention that people suffer from very strong misconceptions, very influential misconceptions. And here's an example from an influential secondary source, Oxford Companion to the History of Modern Science. I've written about this elsewhere, but it's a convenient one sentence definition that Wellman offers. Her definition of materialism is a little restrictive, it's a little limited. It doesn't apply to some of the very interesting materialists. That's not my story today. It's also a very misleading definition of vitalism because, as I'll want to say, Montpellier vitalism in all its diversity, the different actors, the different you know, theorists, almost never, you know, never would be a little strong, but almost never resort to some kind of irreducible, supernatural, mysterious life force. And they're quite critical, as I'll be saying, they're quite critical of invocations of the soul, of animistic approaches in medicine. Um, so here's some more background information. I've mentioned some of this. It's also important, the third point here, that the word vitalism appears first in the context of this school. It's coined relatively late, actually used by the 1770s in uh, a text that very few people have noticed, but it's more prominently used by the 1790s by the dean of their faculty, but he's using the term to describe the sort of 50 years of work. It's a sort of retrospective branding. And interestingly, at first, there's a sort of hesitation between word, the, the word vitalism and the word sensibilist or sensibility, because what they consider vitalist medicine as is a doctrine that has organic sensibility or sensitivity as a kind of core property. And I put a list of some key names. The name that I find, the, the figure that I find the most interesting, original, thorough, is one of the least known because a lot of his writing is medical entries in Diderot and Danobel's Encyclopédie. And it's taken a long while for anyone to notice they're by him. They were signed with a little letter M and it took well, it took 150 years or more for people to notice who that actually was. And indeed, there's no picture that I could find of him. The picture is of better known figures who you see, uh, like Baldu and Martez. So there's just pictures. As I mentioned at the outset, this is chiefly an 18th century phenomenon, that meaning the, the form of vitalism that I'm interested in here. The Montpellier school, as it extends into the 19th century, becomes increasingly ideological. And if I can use demarcation language, moves further and further away from kind of robust scientific practice into ideology. And indeed, in the 19th century, starts to argue spiritualistically or supernaturally or metaphysically about the status of the vital principle. 
And that's a, a story I'm interested in that I've started to write about. And it's not so well known outside of some, some French scholars, but I won't say more about that today. And as a doctrine, vitalism emerges in a context of tension. I mean, this is a little simplified, but I think it's true. And a lot of figures at the time spoke that way. So it, it has a degree of purchase on how they viewed the situation. Tension between animism and mechanism. So animism in the sense, when you encounter that term in the history of medicine, it means explanations that appeal to the soul. You know, animism means other things elsewhere. And most prominently, the, the German professor and physician, Stahl. And on the other hand, so, you know, vitalism, you might say, wants to triangulate animism, mechanism, and, you know, to find a third way. And mechanism, I don't think I need to clarify that term, but it's the project to study the body as if it were a machine or mechanistically. And there are many variants of mechanism. One of the points I want to stress today is that the interesting dimensions of Montpellier vitalism are not as hostile to mechanism as kind of comfortable scholarship might tell us. And my parenthesis there, which might seem a little mysterious, is because the tensions between a mechanistic explanation of life and more organismic, just to use that word, are tensions that play out time and time again in the, the century after my story. And uh, Philippe Pullman and I co-authored a paper a few years ago exactly about man, machine, and embodiment as a sort of problem from the early modern period through to Claude Bernard. In the background, so, you know, vitalism emerges in that kind of theoretical tension. And specifically, there's also an important earlier debate that uh, takes place in the early years of the 1700s, then it gets republished as a collection in 1720. It's a debate between Stahl and the famous Leibniz. And it's a debate on organism, and it's an early use uh, of the term organism. It's arguably the first systematic or rather technical usage of the word. Interestingly, so both of these authors agree that organisms should be distinguished from mechanisms, but Stahl associates organism with soul, with a kind of soul as the controller or the hegemonic entity, whereas Leibniz has a more complexity argument. You know, organisms are not like machines because of their types of complexity. And I suspect, it's hard to show this historically, but what will be the vitalist approach to organism via the metaphor of the beast form, which I'll talk about. Um, so TBD stands for to be discussed. That model is more like the complexity Leibnizian model. It's not interested in questions we would find very typical, which is to say, where is the self? Or for there to be organism, there must be self-consciousness or a center. Very rare. There are very few uh, moments of interest in that question in the vitalist uh, writings. Um, yeah, I'll just say something quickly about this sort of set of distinctions. What I really, the only thing I really should say today, for purposes of my talk, is that one can also explore a distinction between a more medically focused vitalism and a more biologically or embryologically focused vitalism. And the late and regretted Jean Gaillon insisted on this distinction to me a number of years ago. It can bear fruit as a distinction. And I put a wonderful quote from Pong Yem where he clearly is identifying vitalism with the latter, with a more embryological focus. We might say that's, that kind of vitalist is interested in growth, in development, in the mechanisms of, in the forces involved therein. Whereas the medical vitalist is more interested in structure and organization in the sense of how does this type of organization function and how is it different from other types of organization? And um, 
I will come back to the distinction I've suggested in some of my earlier papers on the topic between substance and function as types of vitalism. We'll come back to that. So when I said that the vitalists challenge animism, here is something, here is something that would be what they challenge, which is to say, here is Stahl using the concept of soul to explain life, the functioning of the body, the way the body stays itself, tries to ward off disease and so forth. And they will be critical of this kind of answer and they will favor the answer or the concept of uh, structure. In dealing with possible bad reputation of vitalism in earlier work, I suggested that the kind of structure-focused vitalism of the Montpellier school is a functional vitalism, whereas a substance-focused vitalism matches what people usually mean when they say, this is the silly view, this is the irrational view, this is the overly metaphysical view. And the question of whether or not vitalism is a metaphysics or has to be a metaphysics, something I've gotten interested in in recent years, but I, I won't have time to go into that much today. Suffice it to say that there's an easy way of telling the story to say, look, there's a science-friendly form of vitalism and there's a more metaphysical vitalism. And I've begun to feel like that distinction might not be watertight. So what is functional vitalism? And what is this metaphor? And what does it do? Well, Montpellier vitalism takes as its key concept the animal economy. This is a technical term of the notably the 17th and 18th centuries. And in vitalist usage, it very much is. And I know it's dangerous to talk about predecessor concepts and precursors and whatnot, but the animal economy is very much an organism concept. And I know I mentioned that the word organism had been used in the early 1700s by Leibniz and Stahl. That doesn't mean it went into uh, widespread usage. It took a century for the term to actually sort of stabilize and enter discourse. Now, animal economy is expressed in some key texts of these authors by a metaphor, by the metaphor of the bee swarm. Uh, you may find that intuitively obvious. The bee swarm seems like a giant organism, but it's composed of individual organisms, all of which serve a kind of collective purpose. And that's what interests, or that's one of the big things that interests the vitalists in their reflection on animal economy. So two quotes to that effect. Here, Bordeaux, one of the prominent authors of this school, says that in seeking to understand the nature of the living body and the, the relation between parts and whole, he finds this metaphor, and he does use the language of metaphor in this passage elsewhere, he finds the bee swarm metaphor to be helpful. Now, you know, I have to run along in my slides. And here is Menuret, who I mentioned earlier, the, the less known but fascinating figure. And here he refers to some prominent figures of the period who use the metaphor. And the phrase that I left in italics at the end, um, which I translated as connection of actions, he's interested in the way the actions of individual organs in the body are sympathetically or synergistically coherently linked. Now, since I'm, I'm trying to be uh, you know, punctual and efficient, I've mentioned that there's this focus on structure. And so here's something that I find really fascinating, namely card-carrying vitalist text, which happily uses some mechanistic language, as you can see in the first couple of lines of this quotation, you know, springs, et cetera. It is a criticism, or perhaps one might say a critique of early modern 17th century scientific revolution type mechanism. But instead of saying, this is not what life is, or this is not what the soul is, notice the last sentence of my excerpt. 
the author is complaining that what's lost, lost sight of is organic structure, the source of the main properties of the human body. And this is something that, you know, if I had a bit more time, I'd want to spend more time on because organic structure in relation to machine or mechanism, that, that story can be played out in different ways. The relation between those notions can be played out in different ways. Um, I would suggest that the animal economy in its vitalist usage is more like a complexification of mechanical models rather than kind of absolute opposite. It doesn't invoke fully sort of ontologically other entities or forces. But, and I'll just mention this quickly, vitalists are not the only ones seeking to articulate a sophisticated mechanism or post-mechanist approach to organism focusing on structure. Very prominent figure of the period who's very much in competition in some respects, I mean, which you might say he wins the competition, but there's a lot of professional competition between him and the Montpellier school. And they both, he is more keen to invoke the paternity of people like Borhav uh, in a sort of, again, loose or pluralistic mechanistic framework. And then the vitalists and Howler start to quarrel or quibble over what is the core vital property. And he has a very beautifully argued and very experimentally nourished distinction between irritability and sensibility. The, the Montpellier vitalists who in some ways do seem more metaphysically colored, want a kind of monism of sensibility. They want sensibility or sensitivity to be the core property of life. Um, I'll skip this. It's an interesting quote from Haller where you can see what I've called elsewhere, the sort of Newtonian analogy working. And the vitalists also make a lot of use of Newtonian analogies in their attempt to articulate well, what will become a life science? So as I, I said a minute ago, these projects or programs can be seen. You know, it depends how one tells the story. There is a sense in which they can be seen as gradually and increasing expansions, enhancements of mechanism. And of course, someone might say, well, there comes a point when you're no longer in, um, you know, it ain't Kansas anymore, as it were. And uh, Duchesneau has written a lot of things on this topic. And I borrowed from him the notion of um, expanded mechanism and I gave a bit more content to it in my work. So again, some quotations, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. Here is yet another text by Menuret, where again, lots of mechanistic language, you know, human machine, the springs, the tension, et cetera. But within the space of 10 lines, and if you, you go to the end, you see the parts that I've italicized. First, this very chemical language, no action without reaction. And so that's chemical properties being built into the machine. So that's, again, an enhanced picture of the body machine. And from this conti continuous antagonism of actions, life and health result. You know, he's moving to what we might call top level properties, which are difficult for the mechanist to specify, admittedly. And here's a similar passage from a different text of Minuret's, where there's a mechanistic language, but in the end, he seems to be interested in, you know, the spring, but it's a bit of a metaphor at that point. The mechanistic function by which we have life, health, sickness, and death. Um, what I was calling triangulation earlier, you can see in texts like these. So on the one hand, vitalists say, can you please stop endlessly repeating the mechanistic language because it's something of the past? And uh, not as well known, these critiques of animism, where they sort of want, it's a bit sarcastic. They'll say, well, how do you explain disease? How do you explain how the body fights off disease? invoking the soul. It's a poor concept. It's a poor explanation. 
with regard to whether vitalism is or isn't a metaphysics, a metaphysics of vital force. Bordeaux, in uh, the same, different part of the same passage I was quoting earlier from his main work, has this very, I think, very elegant approach because he recognizes that it's difficult to specify the nature of this so-called force. And he mentions Stahl. And instead of saying Stahl is wrong and I know what life is, or I know how life works, he says we need to go to the level of metaphor. And Stahl would never accept saying, oh, well, we have to go via metaphor to understand life. So that kind of heuristic distance is very characteristic, very distinctive in some of the vitalist authors. And I think um, Peter Hans Ryle's book on this topic makes much out of this, what he calls mediation. So wrapping up, um, my big claims, my basic claims here or today are one that it's, it's a functional rather than a substantival vitalism. It's focus on what organism or animal economy is. That focus doesn't appeal, you know, that way of addressing organism or animal economy doesn't appeal to foundational principles or forces or cells, but to something like organization, more systemic concept. Something I didn't talk about but that I find striking is that it's more materialism friendly than is usually recognized. I'll say more about that discussion possibly. And this focus on structure, which again, one might see as a systemic concept. Um, why should we care about my distinctions, my typologies, my attempt to say, well, not all vitalism is, is X, some of it is Y. Well, I remind you that you have these kinds of blunt definitions, like the first, or a little more subtle and a paper that some of you, I think, know very well, a great paper by Scott Gilbert and Savage Vasarka, where they're looking for a word to capture non-reductionist approaches in current biology, time of their writing. And they say, well, shall we call them vitalism? And they say, well, no, let's not call them vitalism because, quote, you know, vitalism is burdened with metaphysical baggage, you might say. And then they say, well, let's call it organicism. And of course, from the point of view of the mechanist, that's a bit of a funny uh, rabbit out of a hat operation, it's, or rather um, three card Monty. It's vitalism is presented as too mysterious. Let's call the good theory organicism. Some people would say organicism isn't any better. I think I would say that most of the interesting forms of vitalism seem to match what's called organicism rather than the, you know, the weirder view. And one could quibble about the scholarship or rather one could quibble about how Drish's Entelechies or Bergson's Enavitag or Blumenbach's Vis Essentialis are even being used here. I'm not gonna do that today. Um, <clears throat> I'm ending with this slide, which is simply to say, one of the things that I wanted to discuss is the extent to which there's a convergence or an overlap or a synergy, word I've already used recently, between the vitalist project and its language and its concepts and what we might call the constitution of biology, which tends to be presented as a very Germanic emergence of biology. But there's at the very least an interesting uh, historical congruence in the last 20, 30 years of the 18th century, the early years of the 19th century, between these different authors in different contexts that are calling for a kind of individuated science or autonomized science, whether in terms of you know, new rules and concepts or specific entities. And this, including in Montpellier vitalism, takes us well beyond the parameter or parameters of so-called medicine. It takes us into something more physiological, more like general biology. And in other, some of my work and in um, uh, some co-edited work, I've been interested in places in the vitalist texts where you see them seeking to focus 
seeking to sort of turn the focus on a unified science of life. And then my last little bullet point there, one could ask, well, what happens if we integrate my story into a kind of mainstream history? Is it even possible? In some sense, not. Um, the organism, animal economy, bee swarm focus or ideas also bear a lot of resemblance, but in a sort of vague, intuitive way, which makes me uncomfortable because it's not a very strict way, a lot of resemblance to some of the obsessions in 20th and 21st century theoretical biology. What does one do with that? I'll leave that as a question. So hoping that this was of interest, um, thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you, Charles. And um, now we have Phil Sloan who will uh, help with the Q&A. Uh, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Charles. I think you've done an enormous amount of work in taking a vitalism from a, being a term of abuse to actually showing some of the rich and, uh, and important dimensions of, of all of this. And I think you've made some very good point. We do have some questions from the audience that I'm going to start with here. This is from Bettina Burring and uh, the, argue, the question is, how do these concepts relate to emergent properties in the brain? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Phil, of course. Um, okay, that's a bit uh, broad because, you know, which concepts and all that, but there's the word emergence in your question. And indeed, people often want there to be a strong connection between vitalism and emergence or emergentism. That's tricky if one is trying to also be the historian of science or the historian philosopher of science, because it's not clear to what extent there's really strong emergentist language in these texts other than, I mean, indeed, the, the bee swarm is presented as having collective properties, which are, well, it's not that they're not present in the parts because the parts are often described by these authors as themselves little lives. So the parts are not little mechanistic parts, which once put into some super complex interaction have amazing, unpredictable, higher level properties like some versions of emergentism. So that's one conundrum. You know, to what extent is it useful to model the stuff with emergentist language? The other is the issue of mind, since you mentioned, you know, brain. Is consciousness to the brain like, you know, life is to whatever we want, the basic thing to be the body or the structure that sub, what's the word, subtends, subserves life? Well, I mean, maybe, but I'll just say something very, very basic about this. I'll say, it's striking how little these authors are interested in the problem of the mind, which to us seems like an obvious interconnection between what is life, what is mind. So inactivism, embodied cognition, critiques of artificial intelligence. There's, there's lots of work in the last 20, 40, 50, 60 years that insists on a kind of interconnection between life and mind. It's not so present in the text that I was discussing. And the other thing I'd say is I'll, I'll simply refer you to David Chalmers. David Chalmers has a paper, I don't remember right now the reference. He has a sort of minor paper where he briefly explores um, whether the question of consciousness as some kind of special irreducible thing is a vitalistic concept or not. And if that reference really interests you and you can't find it, write to me and I'll, I'll track it down. Obviously, uh, we, we have no uh, other questions right now. Do any of the panelists would like to raise some questions? Let's please do raise your, use the raise hand function if you would. I think Isabel is struggling a little bit with the raise hand function. So just, Isabel, just go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I, I couldn't figure out the raise hand, which is embarrassing. But um, yes, uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, this is like, a uh, super interesting and um, helpful talk. And I just, 
I have a kind of pretty broad conceptual question, I think, which is um, whether there's you have anything to say about, I guess, the milieu in general as a concept as it interacts with the history of vitalism, but more specifically when you're talking about defining vitalism via a kind of um, functional and complexity, not, not the same complexity as emergence, but a different kind of complexity is that, is it important at all to desist? This is a genuine question. I don't know the answer to distinguish between internal complexity um, of the organism and versus or in, in relation to complexity of some relationship between organism and environment. Um, and is that important to um, the figures you study? Well, thanks, Isabel. And, you know, milieu and vitalism is something that is articulated by an author you know well, by Kong Yem. It's not really articulated, you know, if I was going to try and do, it's not exactly potted history, but sort of spontaneous history. I'd say, well, you really do need, one really does need to move in, whether it's post-Darwin, post-Lamarck, post-something move into the 19th century for questions about what is an organism and how does it work to be seriously inscribed in some kind of organism environment relation. Um, that said, is there anything like a developmental system in these authors? Well, but just because Lewontin and Susan Oyama and others tried to model something like those relationships, sort of constitutive relationships between inner and outer, between organism and environment. Um, for one thing, there's not much developmentalist talk in the text I was um, discussing. And I think I mentioned, since this was a recorded talk, I think I mentioned um, this question of vitalism based on the mystery of the egg, you know, the Kong Yem comment that vitalism is this kind of philosophical or metaphysical contemplation of growth versus the more medical kind of vitalism, which is interested in a system in doing justice to the nature of interconnections in a system. You know, in a sense, people who are fans of Aristotle, like David, will sort of recognize those questions like, why is a hand no longer a hand when it's severed from the body? You know, the, that kind of interest in system. So simple answer, not a lot of milieu. Uh, minor historical fact, which is interesting though, Menuret, the hero of my story, Menuret's late works, because he didn't publish a lot of his own work for much of his life, but late in life, he published public health, so hygiene and public health kind of works. So somewhere in the mind of perhaps the cleverest Montpellier vitalist, there was environmentalist or environment focused concerns due to come up a few decades later in his work. That's the answer for now. Uh, we have another question that's come up from uh, uh, Fabregas Tejada Alexandro, uh, and I'll read it out, okay? Fascinating talk, Charles. Thank you. Could you elaborate a little bit more about how you do think this enriched historiography of Montpellier vitalism could intersect with the historiography of organicisms, plural, in the early 20th century biology? Well, thank you, Alejandro. That's a classic case where a really interesting and generous question is really hard to answer, whereas a more hostile question would be easier to answer. Because my answer is something like, yes, I'm really interested in that. It's a challenge to do well. And I keep trying in very, very partial, you know, parcelized way in some of my papers. And I don't think anyone has properly engaged with that. Um, I mean, people who are interested in early 20th century organicism these days, some of the people I know well, friends, colleagues who are interested in that, have a strong theoretical biology 
focus or influence. And when they have that focus or influence, they're sort of in the search for all the incarnations of the good model. There's one good model, you could call it organization, you call it system, call it organism, et cetera. And they are interested in all the nuances of the good model. And I tend to say, okay, but the history is messier. So, you know, I'm not going to deliver if you want a sort of proto systems biology from mid to late 18th century France, I'll sort of say, well, I'm not really going to give you what you want. I, I don't mean you, Alejandro. I mean that, that person, that hypothetical person. That's just the comment on the difficulty. That doesn't mean, as I said, it's not a really, really good question. And um, answer, possible answers would have to include problems like the role of mathematics, which changes drastically in between A and Z in that story. It would have to include Tobias Chung's beautiful work on inner outer relations and how those, you know, the sort of modeling of inner outer relations changes. It would possibly have to include, and I've taken a stab at that too, changes in the organism concept because when uh, the Montpellier vitalists are arguing against mechanism on the one hand and animism on the other, it makes for a very different discursive landscape than um, um, the Cambridge Theoretical Biology Club and whoever they're arguing for or against. And, and as is well known, thanks to Eric Peterson, notably, that group is not in fact monolithic either. And all of them beat on vitalism. <laughs> and of course, maybe that's superfluous because then I could sort of magically say, oh, here's a distinction between substantival and functional vitalism. What you guys are defending is functional vitalism, vitalism and what you're attacking is substantival vitalism. I'm not sure that my distinction magically does away with all the issues. So sorry, messy answer, very, very interesting question. Let's be in touch because I'd like to do more on that topic. See, do we have any, uh, do we have some further questions from the panelists here? Uh, we have a few minutes, I think. I don't have any others in the chat. Room. So Charles, I think some of the answers to the question just posed may lie in a group of relatively unknown uh, neo-Kantian philosophers um, like Bruno Bauch and Otto Liebmann who are working very specifically with the implications of Kant's third critique and with, and with the Kantian account of the organism and, and are also trying to interface with um, a number of, uh, with, with the works of say Oscar Hertwig, in which there is some, in which the, the account of the organism because of experimental evidence in terms of development is constantly is really starting to give some empirical heft to some of these conceptual discussions in which you have on the one side, a clear reaction against vulgar vitalism and a clear dissatisfaction with, with Kant's mechanism and materialist stance. Um, and it's a very complicated story because it's very, not very well known at all. And, I myself am just getting into this discussion. So we also might want to have a discussion about that because some of, the, some of the connections that you might be seeking would be in this group, which is also corresponding with Driesch as well um, and is using his work as a kind of sounding board for uh, their, their, pro their project. Mm -hmm. I've had to, uh, um, two... Two, oh, excuse me, go ahead, Charles, please. No, I was just going to say, I would love it, Chris, if you could put that down, put a version of that down on paper for, for yeah. me. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll, I'll get to you with uh, the other abstract I also owe you. So, <laughs> I've okay, had go a, ahead, Phil. I've had a pair of uh, questions come in from Dan Nicholson. I'll read uh, 
comments or questions sparked by your talk. First, with regards to your terminological preliminaries and the problems you raised regarding the sloppy and con context-dependent usage of the term vitalism. I think similar remarks could be made about the term mechanism, or perhaps we should say mechanicism. Also, also of organicism, clarifying these is also necessary if part of your project is to contrast vitalism with these dis doctrines. Now he's got another section, but let me, let me give you that one and then we'll go to the second part of this question. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, there are long questions. I really like them and they, I don't, I think the time might be a little limited. So I'll, I will also get back to Dan uh, either in parallel or, you know, in the discussion part of this workshop. But um, yeah, I mean, the fact that all of these terms have some degree of context dependency, I can only agree to. Vitalism is a bit particular because to say something obvious, it's used in such pejorative ways. And it's used, it's also used when it's used positively in this incredibly undetermined way, including, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, in a lot of ways that have literally nothing to do with life or organic life or the question of the boundary or the difference between the living and the non-living, which are what I would modestly say need to be criteria in any historical context. Those criteria should be present for us to call something vitalist. Uh, the question of whether Aristotle is a vitalist or not is, a, is its own sort of fun debate to have. Um, <laughs> whereas mechanism, it's dangerous since I'm, I'm disobeying my own methodological strictures, but there is a sense in which some critiques of mechanism really do recur. Of course, something like neo-mechanism post, you know, 1990s, 2000s, completely muddles the issue because they use the word in a genuinely other new way. But your paper on mechanical and organic issues I think is certainly can be understood as a kind of critique that has a history and that one can find earlier instances of, whether in the early 20th century or before. And when you say in one of, the, one of these questions, uh, am I thinking of your work or not? Well, I was thinking of the San Sebastian groups, several of whom are our mutual friends, and Matteo Mosio, and the way in which history for them is material to help a true theory be vindicated. And I think you and I may have disagreed in a friendly way in the past about how history functions, but I guess that will have to be, we'll have to do a, a workshop of our own to, to thrash that one out. Mm -hmm. But I'll copy these questions of yours, so thank you. Okay. So uh, I have to call time because we have to move on to Betty Smokovitis's talk. So thank you, Charles. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much, Charles. You bet. Very good. Betty Smokovitis is professor in the history of science in the Department of Biology and in the Department of History at the University of Florida. Her interests include the history, philosophy, and sociology of the modern biological sciences and the history of migration, ethnicity, and race in the United States with special focus on the history of modern evolutionary biology, botany, genetics, and systematics, and anthropology. She has written extensively on the history of the evolutionary synthesis and is the author of Unifying Biology, the Evolutionary Synthesis and Evolutionary Biology, Princeton University Press, along with many articles, chapters, reviews, and other publications. It is an honor to be here today in celebration of the life and work of David DePew. He has been an inspiration to many of us, especially those of us keen on interdisciplinary work. I recently had to describe David's disciplinary affiliations and found myself in a tough spot. He's a philosopher, a rhetorician, a historian, and someone with a keen sense of political engagement. I think his ability to see the utility and value of various approaches part of his intellectual style. 
And I think this is undergirded by a generous attitude towards the work of others. He's open to approaches and has encouraged younger scholars in their interests. Indeed, at meetings, it is common to see him talking to younger people and always interested in what they're doing. I have here, for example, a photograph of, ta of David taken at the International Society for the History, Philosophy, and Social Studies of Biology meetings in Montpellier, France, that I think captures David's easygoing style and his proximity to younger scholars. This is at the famed Botanical Garden with Yuri Witteven, a historian and philosopher who specializes in systematics during the period of the evolutionary synthesis, and Angeliki Lefkaditu, who is a historian keen on the history of anthropology and race. And both are scholarly areas of inquiry to which David has contributed hugely. Here are two other photographs with people that I would describe as the synthesis industry. Historians, philosophers, sociologists, like the late Jean Guyon and Dick Burian and Anne McNabb, who were and are close colleagues and friends. What I'd like to do today is to give a talk that I think brings together some of David's interests and builds on work he has done. Um, builds on work that he has done on the evolutionary synthesis on rhetoric and the history of biological anthropology and evolutionary biology. I'm going to highlight historical, philosophical, and sociological approaches that also draw attention to language. It matters, especially so in understanding the historical event of the evolutionary synthesis. And let us recall too, that David is at the University of Iowa, which is home to a writing program that is internationally renowned. I'd like to start with the work Historicize, featured in the title of my talk. And to some, it might appear like jargon, a kind of thing common in the humanities, associated, for example, with literary theorists like Frederick Jameson and his well-known slogan, always historicize. But I would argue that there is nothing jargon-esque or fashionable to those of us in history or in evolutionary biology, which is after all a historical science. Does a fossil have much meaning without a sense of where it is found? Not just in what kind of environment, but in what kind of temporal sequence or context of what came before and what comes afterwards. Same as for ideas, beliefs, practices, and even scientific theories. This gets me to my next word, context and contextualize, which adds to the cultural, social, or political, to the historical, as well as the word Presentism, the tendency to project the present into the past or to interpret the past in light of the present. The final point built on these concepts that I want to stress comes from the history and philosophy of science. And that is that science itself is historically rooted and culturally embedded. Next, I want to sort through some of the language of the synthesis and draw some useful distinctions in terminology. We have, for example, the modern synthesis, which comes out of the title of Julian Huxley's book of 1942, titled Evolution, the Modern Synthesis. And this term is an actor's category or term. Then we have the term evolutionary synthesis, which refers to the historical event that took place approximately between 1920 to 1950. Though the chronological beginning and endpoints do vary a bit, but it is primarily a mid-century event. The term comes from Ernst Meyer and William B. Provine's edited collection based on a 1974 conference and it appeared in 1980, titled The Evolutionary Synthesis, Perspectives on the Unification of Biology. So the evolutionary synthesis is the historian's terminology referring to the historical event. Finally, we have the genetic term, 
the generic term neo-Darwinism, which usually refers to the fusion of Mendelian genetics and, gen and Darwinian theory with no really precise chronological timeline. It is an ism, sometimes referring to a belief system not unlike an ideology. This is used most commonly by practicing scientists, though Ernst Meyer repeatedly called for more care in its use since it was first coined by George Romanus to refer to Darwinism without Lamarckism, since Darwin himself, let us recall, adhered to the inheritance of acquired characters. Some more terms that I think are very important, yet are rarely discussed um, to draw some important distinctions. The synthetic theory of evolution. This refers to the theory that emerged during the period of the evolutionary synthesis, but that often gets used for contemporary theory too. Evolutionary biology. This refers to the scientific discipline that emerged during the period of the evolutionary synthesis, where discipline refers to both a community, meaning a social space that opens up, as well as epistemic beliefs, practices, methods, accompanying textbooks, rituals and commemorations, et cetera. Finally, we have the synthesis, which is a kind of abbreviation, shorthand, to refer to a constellation of some of the above and sometimes all of the above. I would like to underscore the importance of these distinctions and, that, and the fact that they are just not made as much as they should be. Indeed, I believe that one reason a great deal of confusion still surrounds the synthesis, what it is, what happened, its significance, and whether or not it holds sway is due to the confusion in terminology. This is the second reason that I, for the confusion that I want to especially focus on here today, as my title indicates, is the lack of historicist as well as contextualist thinking, often in tandem with or as a consequence of the imprecise use of language. This is crucial at the moment since many of us in the history and philosophy of science are grappling with some of the more recent calls for what has been named an expanded synthesis, an extended synthesis, or at times even an overhaul of the synthesis, as some say we have entered the third wave of evolution in the age of genomics. This matters because most of the arguments made by advocates of reform or outright overhaul reveal a misunderstanding of the past, at times a distortion of the past, and in some cases, arguments are actually made that are wholly ahistorical, though they make reference to the past as a kind of convenient caricature, embodying a kind of straw theory that is then knocked down. And here in my talk today, I really wanna focus on evolutionary theory, especially in the next part of my talk, though I will be making distinctions in my own language. I provide here a list of some of the literature that challenges the synthesis in the last 15 or so years, nearly all of which grounds in some view of the history of the synthetic theory and which often blurs the distinction between the historical past, the historical event with the theory as it existed in the context of the evolutionary synthesis or as it exists now. And I know you probably can't read all of them, but this is just a sampler to convince you that a lot is happening and has happened in the last 15 years. But let me also point out that we have actually seen something like this before, at least to those of us alive in the 1980s, like David DePew, who wrote about it. Let's recall the first iteration of the challenges to the synthesis, stemming from a paleobiology, the critique of the adaptationist program, and what went down in the 1980s. So here's a sampler of the talks. 
and the titles of um, the talks, the articles, and the edited collections, and in, at times, entire books. Here's just the sampler. Is a new and general theory of evolution emerging? Is a new evolutionary synthesis necessary? The evolutionary synthesis is only part right, where right is spelt with a W as in Sewell right. And then the response is, but not right enough. And this is a reply to the former title. Beyond neo-Darwinism, the challenge of macroevolution to the synthetic theory of evolution. Darwinism and the expansion of evolutionary theory. Beyond neo-Darwinism, an introduction to the new evolutionary paradigm. Evolutionary theory, the unfinished synthesis. Evolutionary theory at a crossroads, the new biology and philosophy of science. And this one was edited by one David DePew and Bruce Weber. Challenges to the synthesis, the evolutionary dysynthesis, the synthetic theory strikes back, the triumph of the evolutionary synthesis, and finally, Darwinism stays unpunctured. And that's just a sampler of some of the titles that dominated academic headlines in the 1980s. And I have to say, this is only a brief list from the Oxford bibliography entry that I was assigned on the modern synthesis a couple of years ago. And I call this body of literature, you know, the challenges to the synthesis one, the crash goes the synthesis body of literature because I was a graduate student at the time and had to read all of it. And I have to say, I'm not sure that anything actually crashed because it appears to have remained sufficiently intact for the next generation of challengers and now traveling under the banner of once again, the expanded synthesis or the extended synthesis. And here's the list back again to the, um, the, cha the current challenges to the synthesis. In nearly all of the current literature, and it really is exploding, it's almost exponential in its growth, there is a question of whether or not what later becomes the SET or the standard evolutionary theory, SET is used as a kind of acronym, whether or not it exerted a constraining, restrictive, or even an exclusionary hegemonic role. For example, X or Y got left out, was marginalized in some kind of way, doing damage to the progress of science, where X or Y can be a field, an area of inquiry, a subdiscipline, often dominated by an individual. And again, the progress of evolutionary science gets hindered, hampered, stalled. It's a bunch of fuddy-duddies who are keeping everything back. That's the kind of message and coding that is often conveyed in kind of the foundational literature within this group of the challenges to the synthesis. But if we look at the historical record, there's little in the way of a monolithic or standard theory that actually appeared in the 1930s or the 1940s or even the late 1950s during the period of the Darwin centennial when there was a massive kind of rethinking and celebration of evolution because of the 100th anniversary of the publication of The Origin and the 150th um, birth year of Charles Darwin's birth. And this was when some like Stephen Jay Gould um, wrote about the hardening of the synthesis or argued for the hardening of the synthesis, the rise of a new orthodoxy of the synthetic theory around a selectionist call. And as we recall, Gould was actually part, he was one of the leaders of challenge one in the 1980s. And along with this, along with this kind of the rise of the new orthodoxy, the hardening of the synthesis, he did another thing, which is to resurrect the figure of Richard Goldsmith, now reinvented as a kind of heroic heretic 
fighting the new orthodoxy. And let us recall that it was Stephen Jay Gould who pushed Yale University Press to reissue Goldschmidt's 1940 book, The, 19, uh, the Material Basis of Evolution. What we do see coming out of the period of 1930 to 1950, and again, approximately, is a loose consensus that Darwinian selection theory combined with Mendelian genetics within a populational view could explain the origins of biological diversity. It took the concerted efforts of a cluster of theorists, and these, this image comes right out of Doug Fatuma's textbook history. Um, and the, the title of the, the textbook is Evolutionary Biology. It took the concerted efforts of a cluster of theorists working in tandem alongside or with experimentalists and field practitioners to build a kind of consensus around a small number of elements. And these are, one, that natural selection is the primary mechanism of evolutionary change. Two, that it operated on the level of small individual differences making evolution a slow, gradual process. Three, that the same process that operated at lower levels, for example, beneath the species also accounted for higher order phenomena. In other words, there was a continuum between microevolution and macroevolution. These elements of the theory were hardly new, revolutionary, or conceptually profound nor were they even agreed upon by all the individuals keen to align themselves with the new science of evolutionary biology. And Richard Goldschmidt, again, is um, probably one of the best known of the dissidents um, of this period. You know, he was part of evolutionary biology, but he didn't agree with many of the tenets. Indeed, as historian of, of science, Will Provine summarized it, in 1988, what the evolutionary synthesis achieved was actually eliminative. It rid evolutionary theory of the many alternatives to natural selection, and it narrowed the domains of inquiry that also enabled a conversation between a number of areas that pre previously were not in communication with each other. And hence, he renamed it the evolutionary synthesis as the evolutionary constriction. It's not exactly pleasing to the ear, but the point is well taken, the kind of narrowing that happened. This loose consensus enabled a community of researchers, a discipline, if you will, to come together around common problems in evolution and who thus redefine themselves as evolutionary biologists. The term evolutionary biologist gains currency right at this historical moment. And here we see the photographic image of the foundational document for the first International Society for the Study of Evolution, and it's the Society for the Study of Evolution in 1946. And this was followed immediately thereafter by the celebrated Princeton meeting of 1947, when geneticist Herman J. Muller, in a well-known essay, announced the convergence of biological disciplines that saw the emergence of a new synthetic science, a new synthetic kind or type of evolutionist that appeared. Though they may not appear to diverse to us today, and of course this is an understatement, their training, their backgrounds, their research methods, organismic systems, if they had any at all, because some were mathematicians, they were status, statisticians. Um, if, if they had any kind of um, uh, commitments that they shared, I mean, they came from really different biological backgrounds. They also disagreed on a number of points, but ultimately they shared the belief that there was a unified science of evolution that could unify biology within a unified theory of knowledge. 
or at least I would say, rhetorically speaking, that there was an argument to be made for unification and moving forwards towards that. And in the big picture of the evolutionary synthesis, as best embodied by people like Julian Huxley, the first director general of UNESCO in 1946, and let us recall that the S is due to his and Joseph Needham's intervention, it was part of a secular, liberal, and progressive worldview. Disciplines that appeared to be left out, like anthropology, were in fact already being integrated well by 1950. Anthropologists weren't actually part of the Society for the Study of Evolution for reasons having to do with race, the biological basis of which was denounced by anti-racists associated with the Boas School of American Anthropology, and increasingly by individuals like this man, Theodosius Dobzhansky, one of the key players in the evolutionary synthesis, and he was an evolutionary geneticist. He formed a collaboration with anthropologists like Ashley Montague in the early 1940s and then Sherwood Washburn to replace race as a biological reality with the concept of gene pool. The first of the meetings held in Cold Spring Harbor in 1950, and here I have the, the, the edited collection that came out of it, brought together 129 individuals from both anthropology and evolutionary biology. And here are some photographs so you can see some of the groupings between geneticists and anthropologists in various configurations. And all of this, if you want to know more about it, actually forms the backbone of John Jackson's and David DePew's recent book, Darwinism, Democracy, and Race. Integration was also true, though perhaps less successful or visible because there were no grand public meetings on the scale of anthropology for developmental biology, as calls were made to integrate it within evolutionary biology with only a few years of the Princeton meeting by individuals like John Tyler Bonner in 1952 and Conrad Waddington in 1953. Indeed, that process of synthesis was ongoing as calls for more integrative studies took place and as it was recognized by the historical figures themselves it's not as though the evolutionary synthesis or the synthetic theory, whatever emerged out of that, stopped. It was not frozen or lifted out of its context and its, its temporal frame. Even mathematical population geneticists like J.B.S. Haldane recognized an ongoing process of development in the theory which needed to continue to comp incorporate areas like developmental biology. The idea that there was any deliberate hegemonic exclusion is just not supported by the historical evidence. And if anything, let us also recall that embryologists of a preceding generation did not favor the study of evolution because it appeared to lack rigor. It was not sufficiently experimental. Lesser known by proponents of the extended synthesis who point to hegemonic exclusion and who happen to come primarily from zoological backgrounds is that by 1959, right around the time of the Darwin centennial, plant evolutionary biologists like George Ledger Stebbins recognized the importance of the gene to character transformation. And this he thought was the next great step in evolutionary biology. Elsewhere, I've talked about the quiet moments of integration, when new methods or techniques or insights are incorporated from other disciplines or other kinds of intellectual spaces and are used to solve or even to reframe persistent problems. But we seem to place an emphasis on conflict, on controversies and friction so that individuals like Ernst Meyer and George Gaylord Simpson, who were often museum workers with a knack 
of defending territory. And remember, you know, they were working on mechanisms of speciation, species definitions. They were systematists. And, and Gaylord Simpson was a paleontologist, while Ledyard Stebbins was an evolutionary geneticist moving into morphogenics and developmental genetics by about 1958, 59. And he worked in the area until the mid 1970s and was in contact with people like Waddington, with whom he collaborated in various organizations in institutional settings in the early 1980s. Developmental biology was just, was actually being integrated, or at least an integration was being attempted while the Darwin centennial of 1959 was already underway. So let me just quickly try to wrap it up to say that when it comes to the SET, the so-called standard evolutionary theory, what is needed is careful, close examination of the past in historicist and contextualist terms. It actually gives us a far more nuanced and complex series of happenings that defy easy characterization into any one standard narrative with a standard evolutionary theory. The actual points of agreement in the 1940s were minimal and involved so many diverse tools, methods, research traditions, organismic system, different levels of analysis, and different subdisciplines that were supposedly left out, but were in fact already being integrated at the same time as the supposed hardening of the synthesis in 1959. Let me here show you here some of the panels that comprise only a small group of participants at the 1959 Darwin Centennial. And it included something like 2,500 registrants, just to give you a sense of the attempt at integration, which is ongoing. Here we have panel two, here we have panel three, man as an organism, and here we have panel five. And there were five of these panels, some do not have photographs, but just to give you a flavor of the disparate number of people, the, the, the areas that were coming together within this uh, celebratory atmosphere. And it really does depend hugely on who you are looking at and who you are tracing and the area that you, of study that you are examining. If you focus only on Meyer and Simpson in systematics or paleontology, you may see exclusion controversy and perhaps even some orthodoxy. If you focus on Dobzhansky and his area of evolutionary genetics, you get a different picture. And if you focus on Stebbins, you get another picture still, one of quiet integration that incorporated morphogenesis, development with evolution and molecular biology at a much earlier period of time. So to close, what we need is a more historicist, and contextualist understanding of the 1930s and 40s. And we need to go beyond into the 1960s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s to appreciate the ongoing processual nature of integration and to recognize that what counts as the synthetic theory, its central tenets and first principles might appear to vary depending on field experimental system, methodology, the generation of the scientists, or even individual preference, then as well as now. There is a historicity to the theory itself, as well as varying contexts of the theory. And it might actually be more useful to speak of multiple evolutionary theories, to take a pluralistic view that worked then and continues to work now. Instead of thinking in terms of some kind of monolithic standard, um, essentialized evolutionary theory, and it does have 
abundant, rich instantiations. It still provides rich resources for further investigation and retains a large measure of its explanatory power. So thank you. A final image of David Debut taken at a conference on the evolutionary synthesis in Paris, France in 2011. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Betty. We already have questions from the audience as I'm moderating uh, this question and answer session. So first question is from Stuart Newman. Uh, he says, and I'm gonna read this out. This is what Brian, uh, Brian Charlesworth one of the senior figures of population biology wrote in his review in Science, Science Magazine, of Gerhardt and Kirshner's book in 2005. And this is the quote from the review. Until we have a predictive theory of developmental genetics, our understanding of the molecular basis of development, however fascinating and important in reve uh, revealing the hidden history of what has happened in evolution, sheds little light on what variation is potentially available for use of selection. This seems to me like a hegemonic, like a hegemonic move. So, so Betty, your response? I love, uh, I love the question. Statement question. I, I love the question because I think it makes my point beautifully that what you're seeing is a confusion between um, what Charles Worth is saying in 2005 and what the 1930s and 40s entailed. So, you know, what Stewart has done is to show exactly what I think is happening, which is, you know, what Charlesworth is like second generation. And you know, what I'm, what I'm saying in this paper and what I've been saying increasingly is that we need to study the 1960s, the 1970s in particular, because I think what happens at that time is that there is a generation that comes in that becomes kind of, I think it's a generational hardening. I don't know precisely what happens in the 1970s, but I can tell you when I got to evolution um, as an undergraduate, it was cast in stone. The definition of evolution, a relative change in gene frequencies. I wanna see the, I wanna see somebody do a project or a study on um, E.O. Wilson and um, Bossert, the little textbook that used very, very heavily all through the 1970s. And I think something happens in the 70s, something happens that's generational. But my point is that when people talk about the evolutionary synthesis, and when they talk about the 1930s, the 40s, that they locate that, you know, that's different from 2005. I'm a historian, so what I try to do is to focus on the past. And what I'm seeing is that there's a kind of, again, there's this, I don't, conflation, confusion, where people aren't thinking about the past. I mean, people, you know, if you're a scientist, you're not immersed in the texts of the 1930s. I don't expect that. But I think if people just exert a little bit more um, uh, care with the language and with the history, we're all going to end up in a much better place. Stuart, have I responded? I'm not denying that that is, that sounds like hegemonic exclusion, okay? That, what Charles Wood is saying in 2005 does not, does not have anything to do with 1930 to 1950 or 1959. And you know, I'm fascinated by these uh, disputes that I see. And again, my other point was that we tend to focus on this kind of uh, the rhetoric of, of conflict. And we don't look at all the people who are just quietly doing the work. And it comes back to Philip Honinger's original question that he posed after, um, Philippe Huniman's talk, I thought that was right on the mark and that's what I've answered. If you focus on Meyer and if you focus on Simpson in the 1960s, you're gonna be seeing boundary work. I don't see them as gatekeepers. That's not 
I like the term boundary work because that's what they're doing. They're negotiating the boundaries of what will be evolutionary biology. And you know, Meyer wants to lift biology um, from complete reduction to physics and chemistry. It's something like physics and chemistry. It's rigorous, but it's right. its own autonomous science. So, I mean, I don't know if that answers Stewart's question. So Stewart is writing back saying that he quote, understands the historical distinction, but he thinks that the, the lines have hardened in the last, in the last decade. That, I mean, that, that, you know, Stuart, I'm, I'm following it. And I'm, I mean, the, as you know, the literature coming out is immense. I can tell you that there was a superb um, session that very few people attended at the Ishkabibble meeting on theoretical population genetics. And these were critics. And I attended that workshop and I found it fascinating. You know, Arlen Stolfitz, um, yeah. it, was a, it, was, it was a really, really good discussion, I thought. And we came down to, you know, I left that, that session and I said, there's, there's generationally, there's something that happens in the 1970s with people who, who come out of that period. Okay, so we have another question and I see your hand up, David. We have another question from Benjamin Feldman, which is a more general discussion of, um, this is his question now. How do you think the paradigm shift notion, this is the, the Kuhnian oh. uh, notion. Yeah has contributed to, to people erroneously claiming opposition to new ideas in evolutionary theory, <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, more generally. Well, I, I'm not sure what, a, I don't know what a paradigm shift is. I don't know what a paradigm is. I come out of that school, you know, I had to read Margaret Masterman's essay. How many different definitions are there of paradigm in Thomas Kuhn's work? I mean, it's certainly tempting to, to you know, to, to kind of go there as the extended synthesis, a kind of paradigm shift. Somebody gave a paper on that recently, but you know, I, I just don't find that helpful because I don't see, I see process. I do see moments. I see pivotal moments and I see process, but I don't see any, some huge transformative event or break. Yeah. And I, I think the key question here too is how, what historical actors are you looking at? So some yeah. of my work really focuses on, Charles has this uh, focus too on, on individuals who are not necessarily as known but have quite clear formulations of a number of, of key topics that, anyway. So David, you had, you had a question, comment, and then no, we have- I, I wanna thank Betty out for- of time, so I wanna thank be Betty. efficient. I want to thank Betty good. for this uh, really good talk because it's one of those things that kind of provokes me, even though she was kind enough not to push the point, uh, to kind of self-criticism, like some old revolutionary being tried at, at the, one of Stalin's kangaroo courts. Um, I, um, and John knows this, John Jackson, that uh, the philosopher in me does want to use conceptual distinctions to sort of agree with some of these exclusions. <laughs> and I, I think anybody who's reading my work should realize that that's a, a by, by what Betty's plea is like kind of a failing. <laughs> uh, so I, I think for instance, that um, neo-Darwinism can be, all these things, just like um, Charles said, can be used as terms of abuse and they actually enter into history that way. Um, Neo-Darwinism Neo uh, basically I, I think of as uh, accepting Weismannism, right? Which I guess is the other way of saying excluding Lamarckism, right? Um, and then uh, I think that goes on for a long time. And I, I, and I think that um, the thing that emerges in the evolutionary synthesis, both before and after the forties, but more after is this notion of the creativity of natural selection and that it's not just eliminative. So um, you can find in the period of post Weismannism plenty of eliminationists and they can be criticized. I know people like Stuart would criticize them because then you can, you can put 19th century uh, post Spencerian uh, nature, red and tooth and claw stuff onto them and then Having done so, you can reject the whole tradition and start over again. Um, and I, I do think that that is a dynamic that your history has to actually incorporate. Um, 
the the other one is um uh, uh well that was the key one uh, uh i i think for instance that the question then about who's in and out of the synthesis which floats around the meyer provine volume um and the and the archival material that backs it up um uh uh, is that, uh, you know, there was a big effort to say, well, some people just aren't creative enough, right? Muller. So let's throw him out. Why? Because he's on the opposite side of Dobzhansky with respect to the issue of balancing selection. And so when you, you notice that in that, Muller's not included, right? That's it's really weird. It's, I, I know. And, and you know, I, I, I see Muller. I see Muller in, at Princeton. It's like, what happens to Muller? Right. So I'm just saying that part um, um, that I, I'm I tend to take sides. I'm I have to admit, I'm sorry. Um, and um, uh, but in the in, but I guess what I'm saying here is that in any of the histories of the kind you want, you've got to you have to. Uh, that's what you mean by boundary work. I dig it. You have to give an account of these attempted exclusions. Right. OK, so, Phil, I do see your hand up, but I actually would like to go to the audience. Okay, why don't we use um, the, uh, the ones on the chat? OK, right. So because so Richard Burian has what he calls a huge question, uh, oh. a huge question. Um, so I'm quoting him now. Uh, so I have a huge uh, question, but the uh, one of the answers to which would be helpful and important to the entire discussion of this wonderful symposium. Thank you. Um, one of the contexts that has received um, very little mention in both Philippe's and Betty's presentations is the change is that of the changes in the mathematical and physical tools uh, and techniques both over time and across disciplines. And this is also the work of Jean Baptiste Godwall. Uh, Richard doesn't say that. Uh, he he says, "I'd be interested to hear how either of these speakers address the extent." and importance of these changes in understanding conceptual, theoretical, and social changes that took place in our understanding of the uh, evolutionary, uh, in the understanding of the evolutionary syntheses. Well, so tools and methods development. Well, Dick, I mean, that was, that was what Will Provine did beautifully with the Sewell Wright biography, and I build on that. And I've written about, you know, the, the mathematicians, but that's not my primary area. I wanted to get at discipline and to see the, you know, the, the kind of the big picture to get at the event as an event in what Bill Kimler, that question that Bill Kimler posed earlier. But I think the mathematics is actually, I mean, that dominated the 1980s. We didn't have anything in the way of plants, as you know, there wasn't very much on plants or organisms and the synthesis. So I would not say it's done. I would not say we're done. I think there's work that remains, but I do think people like Provine have, you know, that Sewell Wright biography is, is just, it's monumental. And then there's, you know, Jean, Guy, Jean Guyon did such a wonderful job uh, with, you know, the, the big narrative view and looking at all kinds of other aspects. So I would not say that the mathematics or the tools or the techniques. Um, I mean, at one point in unifying biology, I say, you know, I, I locate people and I say, some of them are working at their desk. Some of them are working in the field. Some of them are working in, their, in, in the lab. They're working in these different scientific environments, which is a way of saying there are theorists, the mathematicians, there are the empiricists, you know, there are people who work with wild populations and then there's people who do evolutionary work in the lab. This is a heterogeneous group of people. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I'm sort of surprised to see somebody asking about mathematics because we've had so much work in that area. So I hate to cut this conversation off because it really is fascinating, but we, we are due for a break. Um, and so I have to call time and we will see everyone back in about 30 minutes at four o'clock. Thank you very much.